let's take a look at Joshua chapter 17 tonight. Now, <clears throat> we're still trudging through the description and the outlay of these different territories, and there's nothing real a lot of fun about that. We don't understand a lot of these names and cities and all this stuff. But there's a couple of points that I want to bring out that the Lord laid on my heart tonight, and then there's something that I want to share with you. And hopefully, we can uh, get some good out of our study tonight. But let's pray and ask for some help, because I don't ever want to be presumptuous and think that I can do this in my own strength and power. So, Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we're here tonight because we love you. Uh, you first loved us. We're grateful. We want to expose our minds and our hearts to your truth because we're a people with a fallen nature. And we need your truth to hold us steady in your kingdom. Uh, Lord, we know that our Bible study is in service to the gospel, and we thank you for that. We pray that you'd show us uh, that principle in our study here tonight. And we pray that you'd be pleased with our spending our time with you here we love you tonight in Jesus' name, and we ask for your help in his name. Amen. Uh, volume okay? <clears throat> All right. Joshua chapter 17, verse 1. There was also uh, a lot uh, for the tribe of Manasseh, for he was the firstborn of Joseph, Joseph namely uh, for Machir, the firstborn of Manasseh, the father of Gilead, because he was a man of war. Therefore he was given Gilead and Bashan. Can you put that map up, Courtney? Uh, you remember on the east side of the Jordan, uh, that area right there, uh, Gad and Manasseh, that was called Gilead. And uh, Gilead uh, was one of the grandsons of Joseph. And Anyway, you heard what the text said. Verse 2, And there was a, a lot for the rest of the children of Manasseh, according to their families, for the children of Abiezer, the children of Halek, the children of Asriel, the children of Shechem, the children of Hefer, or Hefer, the children of Shemida. These were the male children of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, according to their families. Uh, but Zelophehad, the son of Hafer, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, had no sons but only daughters. Okay, so that was a little heavy. But anyway, so one of Joseph's great-grandsons, Zeholophad, uh, he didn't have any sons. He just had daughters. That's basically what it was saying. And these are the names of his daughters, Malah, Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Tirzah. And they came near before Eleazar the priest, before Joshua the son of Nun, and before the rulers, saying, The Lord commanded Moses to give us an inheritance among our brothers. Therefore, according to the commandment of the Lord, he gave them an inheritance among their father's brothers. Ten shares fell to Manasseh besides the land of Gilead and Bashan, which were on the other side of the Jordan. Because the daughters of Manasseh received an inheritance among his sons, and the rest of Manasseh's sons had the land of Gilead. And the territory of Manasseh was from Asher to Michmathoth, that lies east of Shechem, and the border went along south to the inhabitants of Tapua. Manasseh had the land of Tapua, but Tapua on the border of Manasseh belonged to the children of Ephraim. And the border descended to the brook Cana, southward to the brook. These cities of Ephraim are among the cities of Manasseh. The border of Manasseh was on the north side of the brook, and it ended at the sea. Southward, it was Ephraim's. Northward, it was Manasseh's. And you can see that. Uh, you see the light yellow just above Judah and below Manasseh? That's Ephraim, that territory there. Over here on the other side of the Jordan, uh, Gad and Manasseh up there, that was Gilead and Bashan. That's what they called that land. And so if that makes, helps make some of this make a little bit of sense by seeing it, then maybe that'll help. Um, northward it was Manasseh's, and the sea was its border. Manasseh's territory was adjoining Asher on the north and Issachar on the east. 
And in Issachar and in Asher, Manasseh had Beth Sheon and its towns, Ibliam and its towns, the inhabitants of Dor and its towns, the inhabitants of Endor and its towns, the inhabitants of Tanakh and its towns, and the inhabitants of Megiddo and its towns. Three hilly regions. Yet the children of Manasseh could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities, but the Canaanites were determined to dwell in that land. Verse 13, And it happened when the children of Israel grew strong that they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not utterly drive them out. What's wrong with this picture? We're seeing this over and over and over again as we're divvying up this land the lord was very clear i want you to utterly destroy them i want you to drive them out i want you to take the land get rid of them right but none of them seem to do that now before we get to looking and pointing the fingers at israel and saying these are the bad guys because they didn't obey daddy we're no different we're no different it's our resistant nature uh to god uh, and we've got a fallen nature, and we've got a carnal nature, and we've got a disobedient nature, and so we're no better. But I'm going to show you uh, something in the end of how this serves the gospel when we get done here. But th this seems to be a recurring thing. Do you agree with that? Okay, verse 14. <clears throat> then the children of Joseph spoke to Joshua, saying, Why have you given us only one lot and one share to inherit? Since we are a great people, inasmuch as the Lord has blessed us until now. There it is. There's the human nature showing its ugly face. What is it? Huh? Jealous, envious, greedy, selfish, self-centered. What, <laughs> what about this man? They got more than I did. How come we didn't get... We're a great, we're a great people. The Lord's blessed us. We're, you see the religious... The Lord's blessed us. We're a great people. How come we only get one chair, right? Not fair. Verse 15. So Joshua answered them, <laughs> If you are a great people, then go up to the forest country and clear a place for yourself. <laughs> so, so you're such a great people, so blessed by the Lord, such a strong people, you got such, you got such a good thing. Why are you whining about the territory you're getting? And get up there and get to work and go to clearing it, right? Okay, if you're great people, then go up to the forest country and clear a place for yourself there in the land of the Perizzites and the giants. Since the mountains of Ephraim are too confined for you, clear you out a spot, right? But the children of Joseph said, The mountain country is not enough for us. And all the Canaanites who dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron, both those who are of Beth Sheon and its towns and those who are of the valley of Jezreel. So we're starting to sound like that group of people who left Kadesh Barnea to spy out the promised land and came back. They went in fearful and they came back with a report that was fearful. There's giants over there, and there's no way. They got fortified cities. There's, see, they're fearful because the Lord has already told them, right? I'll drive them out from before you. It's not a matter of how powerful they are or how intimidating they are or what kind of army equipment that they have. It's about this right here. It's not an external problem. It's not an equipment problem. It's an internal heart problem. They don't believe God. You ever struggle with that? Well, I want my way. I got this. You just take a break over there, Lord. I got this one. This is an easy one, right? It's our nature. But do we understand that everything is happening? The book of Hebrews says that all the uh, fumbling and bumbling and stumbling that Israel did, are, it's an ex they were an example to us. 
Now, I'm not trying to pretend like this is some kind of an exhaustive study because I know it's not. You can't exhaust the Word of God. The book of Hebrews also says that the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than into it, so able to do all kinds of things. So I know this isn't exhaustive, but this is just what the Lord has given me. But we're seeing human nature present itself again in spite of all the miraculous goings-on All the promises that God has kept. His incredible faithfulness. And what do we see? We see greed. We see selfishness. We see resistance and hostility toward God's word. We see disobedience. Right? We see envy and strife. I wish I looked that up. I didn't think about that. Envy and strife and so on and so forth. We see these things. But do we understand that while, uh, for lack of a better word, the law can point out and identify the problem when we look into, as James says, the perfect mirror. That the law is perfectly capable of identifying where we fall short of the glory of God, right? But the law is powerless to change it. It's like when I look in a mirror, the mirror at my house I'm talking about, when I go in the bathroom and I look in the mirror, I can look in the mirror, and the mirror will tell me that my face is dirty. But it's powerless to clean it up. And it's the same thing with the law of God it, is, it serves its purpose. When we look into the mirror, it identifies what's dirty and what's fallen and what's separated from God. But it's powerless to clean it up. Enter the unfolding plan of God for redemption in Christ Jesus by way of the gospel. You see, the law is powerless to forgive our sin and to save us from our sin. But it's very good at identifying it. Does everybody agree with that? Uh, Where did I leave off? Okay, verse 17. Wow. This is going a lot quicker than I thought. And Joshua spoke to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, saying, You are a great people. And have great power. You shall not have only one lot. Verse 18. But the mountain country shall be yours. Although it is wooded. You shall cut it down. And its farthest extent shall be yours. For you shall drive out the Canaanites. Though they have iron chariots and are strong. Scared. Fearful comes from a place of not believing what the Lord said, what the Lord told them. And it's the same thing that we struggle with to this day. It's why we keep encountering over and over and over and over again. A lot of the stuff that we study, the principles are the same, and they're repetitive, and sometimes it's redundant, and sometimes there's things that our nature would rather be doing than to come and to hear this stuff again at church. But it's important that we keep exposing our hearts and our minds to the Word of God because we got a nature that never stops. And it's always one to resist the Lord. Now, how is this, all this, this division of property and this conquering the promised land and all the things that we're wading through reading all this, how is this in service to the gospel? How can this be in service to the other than this is where it began and this is how the plan started and it's unfolded up to time in history up to now, right? We see Israel example as they are, the book of Hebrews tells us, to us. But it's not so much... I'm winging it here. It's not so much about pointing out Israel's faults and flaws as it is in taking note 
of the faithfulness of God in spite of their stubbornness and in spite of their disobedience. And you do know that we're still very much Israel, even in Christ a lot of times. But what I hope to point out to you here tonight, and it'll take me a little bit to explain it too, what I hope to point out to you tonight is to confirm again, yet again, and again and again and again, if that's what it takes, to point out that the Lord is not looking over the banister of heaven and wringing his hands thinking, oh goodness, what am I going to do with these folks now? No, he knew it all along. This was the plan all along. The redemption of, the, redemption of Adam and all his posterity in Christ Jesus through the way of the, by way of the gospel. And, and, and here, here's what I mean by that. Even in the names of the twelve sons of Israel, of Jacob, there was a hidden prophetic message given to us. Now, it, it, I, I, I was stu- doing some research online and that stuff, and I found some things that were inaccurate, so I, I had to go back and forth and dig this up myself and I I still use the stuff but anyway you've got to go to Revelation chapter 7 and it begins in verse 5 and it's the part where he's identifying who will be the 144,000 Jewish evangelists because the order of Jacob's sons has changed over there right okay so if you look over in Revelation chapter 7 uh, you'll see it orders 12,000 from this tribe and 12,000 from this tribe and 12,000 from this tribe. Well, the order, uh, Reuben was the oldest, but because of Jacob's prophecy in Genesis 49, he fell from that spot of being the firstborn and, and having those privileges. And Judah got that. So the order of it changed. And there was one more change. It took Dan out of the lineup and inserted Manasseh and I know now why because this is the message that the Lord is trying to give to his church that even all the way back from the beginning the plan was redemption in Jesus from the beginning from before the foundations of the world that was the plan we have a nature that wants to be involved in our salvation and we want to feel like we did something so we can pat ourselves on the back and say look at what a good boy i am but unfortunately all have fallen short of the glory of God, according to Isaiah. And so we don't have that, but we want it. You see, we want to be a good boy. We want to be, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But I, we're never going to find the day when we're not just as desperate for our salvation in Christ as we were on day one when we cried out and said, save me. Does everybody agree with that? It was the plan for them. It's still the plan for us. If you go to Revelation and get that order of the sons of Israel, whom the 12,000 from each tribe would make up the 144,000, it goes like this. Can you put that one up there, Courtney? The order changes. Instead of Reuben being first, it's Judah. And then Reuben is second. And then down where you see Manasseh, that should be Dan. But the Lord switched that out. And this is why. You've got to go back and forth between Genesis 29 and 30 and even over to 35 and Revelation 7. And you've got to combine what the name of the child means with what the mother said about that child when she gave him that name. But this is what you come up with when you run down through there. Praise the Lord. He looked on my affliction. Good fortune comes. Happy am I. My wrestling has made me forget my sorrows. God hears me, has joined me, rewarded me, and exalted me by adding the son of his right hand. It was the same for them as it is for us to this day. And God even hid a message in there. You know, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. And it's the glory of kings to search a matter out. And I'm grateful for the people who've gone before me who helped me include me in on finding this because I just rejoice when all this came together and I read that. 
God's not surprised by our resistance. He knew it from the beginning. He, he knew that I was a knucklehead when he saved me. He knew that the children of Israel were knuckleheads when he saved them. Mike, he knew you were a knucklehead when he brought you to Kennett. He stuck you in this church. That's why he put you with the knuckleheads. <laughs> The plan, and all that short, I guess I was bad planning on my part. I was so focused on this hidden message that uh, I, didn't, I didn't realize that I didn't have enough stuff to go 20 or 30 minutes. But anyway, we're going to call it a night right there because I haven't worked on the rest of it yet. But when we're doing our Old Testament study, I would like to suggest that you keep in mind that it's real easy to get a religious, legalistic mindset. It's easy to do because we've all got a Pharisee in us. It's also really easy to look at them and go, Wow, what is the matter with those guys? Man, how come they didn't know about But we're just like them. I want you to remember that all of our Old Testament Bible study is in service of the gospel, just like our New Testament Bible study is in service of the gospel because from before the foundations of the world, God set a plan in motion to redeem Adam and all that he lost and restore to us that relationship that he had with his friend Abraham. And it was quite simple. Abraham believed God and God credited that to him as righteousness. And God called him a friend. I want that. Do you? And we'll probably thank you.